and welcome back to Franklin Covey's weekly podcast, now twice weekly podcast on Leadership with Scott Miller. That's me. I'm the privileged host of this program each week where I get the honor twice a week now on Tuesdays and Fridays to interview some of the world's most renowned thought leaders, experts, business titans, best-selling authors, four-star generals, people that have done remarkable research or in some cases even survived unspeakable tragedies. And what they all have in common is they've shown the courage to talk about it, to share it, the abundance mentality, to teach each of us through their own experiences and journeys how to become a better leader. This is a leadership podcast, but we talk about topics that are adjacent to leadership, how to build great culture, how to build a culture of engagement, a culture of inclusion, how to be a better leader as an executive suite officer, or perhaps you're a first-level, first-time leader. Maybe you're not a formal leader in your workplace, but you're a leader in your family or with friends or just in your own life. And so this is why now On Leadership is the world's largest weekly leadership podcast, not solely because of my interviewing skills, you know that, but because of the profound insights that our guests bring to us each week. And today, another one who has agreed to come back for her second appearance, and we're delighted to feature Sally Helgeson. She is arguably known as the world's most premier expert on women in leadership and how to build inclusive cultures so that women can contribute their fullest in the workplace and in life. Her newest release is a book called Rising Together, How We Can Bridge Divides and Create a More Inclusive Workplace. Sally, welcome back to On Leadership. Thank you, Scott. It's wonderful to be here with you. So, Sally, you are an icon in the leadership space. You have been authoring and writing for, gosh, three-plus decades. You were gracious enough to guest with us about two years ago. I think you were like number episode number 167 or something like that, where we featured one of your seminal books, How Women Rise, that you co-authored with the famed leadership expert Marshall Goldsmith, Break the Twelve Habits Holding You Back from Your Next Raise, promotion, or job. Today, we're going to talk about some of the insights in your new book, Rising Together. But would you indulge me? Would you take a few minutes and reorient your journey as an author, as a coach, as a leadership expert, and the reason why you wrote this seminal book, How Women Rise, and then we'll pivot into your newest release, Rising Together. Certainly. uh, How Women Rise came out of the 35 plus years I've been working with women leaders around the world uh, and helping them develop themselves to their highest potential. And what I saw was that many of these women were held back by some of the same internal barriers. And I wanted to write about what those were. I was also aware of my colleague Marshall Goldsmith's wonderful book, What Got You Here Won't Get You There which was about the internal barriers that hold successful people back. So I thought that I would adapt sort of Marshall's structure and approach to those internal barriers, but focus on women. So that's why I engaged Marshall as the co-author. We wanted to focus on what are those internal barriers in women. Those we identified 12, essentially. And the book has been successful beyond um, our expectations <laughs> and the publisher's expectations. We have sold in 23 languages wow. uh, now, and uh, it's really been quite a phenomenon. Sally, I hope you find this as a compliment, because that's my intent with saying it, but I would argue that you're sort of the modern day E.F. Hutton, and some people might have to Google that, because when Sally talks, people listen, regardless of gender, or quite frankly, regardless of topic, because Um, A, it's your delivery. (laughs) You're very calm and you're very uh, intentional, but you also have paid the price to really study the dynamics of culture and leadership and when women succeed and when they don't and what are the dynamics of that. When you are entering this level of influence that is sort of enviable from all thought leaders, how do you choose what topic you're going to write about? You've written this new book, Rising Together, Building a Culture of Inclusivity. How do you choose what you're going to opine on when you are a modern day E.F. Hutton. I love that image of <laughs> E.F. Hutton. I remember those commercials very well. Uh, and so people may have to Google that. <laughs> but 
Yeah, well, I usually choose it because an idea, I realize there's a question I need to address. And that's exactly how Rising Together evolved. Uh, it was really specific. I had been asked to give a women's leadership uh, talk, uh, workshop, at the Construction Super Conference in Las Vegas. This was a huge conference. I think there were about 6,000 people there. And I asked the conference organizers what to expect. And they said, well, probably be about 150 women. This was a breakout. And, but they'll be in construction and they'll have real questions about how do they reach their highest potential. Okay, I can do that, you know, all day long. So I showed up in the room at the Wynn Hotel and there in the room were about 350 people and about 70% of them were men. I could not have been more surprised and I was unprepared because I was there to tell women what was getting in their way. So I asked people in the audience, the men, the women too, you know, why are you here? And what the men said over and over didn't surprise me. They said, our sector needs to get much better at attracting and retaining talented women and other diverse employees. We don't have much of a history of that. We've got to do it. We've got to get better. Um, so we hope we'll get some ideas from you. And then one of the participants, an executive, a senior executive, stood up and he said something I'll never forget. He said, we hope that you do, do not waste your time telling us why we need to get good at this. We understand, we get it, but we have no clue as how to do it. The specifics, the hows, and I thought, Got it. Message received. How Women Rise was a worldwide success because it focused on the hows. I'm going to do the same thing for organizations, for leaders of all kind, men, women across the board. How do we get better at um, engaging people uh, from very diverse backgrounds and values? Looking at gender, looking at race, ethnicity, age, sexual identification across the board, but also values and experiences, because that's a big area of difference often today as well, uh, especially given the global nature of organizations. So that's what I decided to do. I wanted to look at that and get really specific with the house. Before we dive into your book, Forbes has identified you, anointed you as arguably the premier leadership expert on women in leadership. You are an enormously in-demand uh, speaker, coach. Every publishing house in America would love to publish your next book. You've gotten a lot right. But I'm also guessing you've gotten some things wrong or you've changed your mind. Could you share a couple of things, maybe in a vulnerable moment, to say, what have you changed your mind on, either through the changing times or you were, your research evolved? Are there a couple of things you might confess to say, you know, on this topic, I've changed my mind? What? Not really. <laughs> I, I can't think of something that I wrote about where I changed my mind. Do I change my mind about how I do things? Do I change my mind sometimes in terms of the advice I've given on coaching? Yes, absolutely. I've gotten much tougher in terms of coaching, more demanding that people behave in a highly intentional way and that they spell out what their intentions are to begin with. Have I dramatically shifted how I deliver workshops? And this is actually helping me think through that, yes, I have changed my mind. Um, i very different in how I approach workshops in that it's very focused on the how. You know, this is, this is a lesson. Now, how can you apply it? Let's think that through. Let's practice in real time how, how you can apply that. 
So yes, when I think about that, that has impacted my writing. I think like a lot of writers and people who think about things, I was very caught up in the larger, what should we do and why should we do it? And how does this fit into larger social and organizational change um, patterns? But now those questions aren't that interesting to me. The questions that are interesting to me are highly specific and much more tactical than strategic. So in that way, I have changed. And I would say that in terms of my writing, that, that has evolved as well. So thanks for pushing me on that because I hadn't thought through how that evolution had affected my writing. Sally, you focus this book on the concept of creating a more inclusive culture. I'm going to have you define what that means because I think there still is a lot of opinions on what ex or inclusivity looks like and what you mean by that. And the premise of this book is that there are triggers. There are eight of them you identify. In fact, the book is architected around these eight triggers. They are in order, visibility, managing perceptions, confidence, and competence. What are you trying to say? It's not fair. The grapevine and the network, that's not funny. And attraction, the unfur uncomfortable bits. We'll talk about two or three of those in a moment. Tell us why you organize the book around this concept of triggers and what are triggers as it relates to creating an inclusive workplace. Certainly, Scott. First, I would like to say that we can define the idea of an inclusive workplace pretty clearly. And I think it, it's a concept that can sound pretty fuzzy, but basically an inclusive workplace is one in which everybody, the largest percentage possible of people, feels valued for their uh, potential, not just their contribution, and feels as if they matter in the organization in terms of its mission, in terms of its purpose. They have that sense. And for myself, I think I can always tell if an organization actually is inclusive or just has a nice sounding mission statement um, because people tend to speak about we as opposed to they. So a lot of organizations may think they're very inclusive, <clears throat> excuse me, but if their people are saying, well, they always and what they seem to expect, if you hear that a lot, then you can pretty much guess that it's an organization that has some distance to go in terms of becoming more inclusive. So that's my definition. Uh, the triggers seemed, I knew that, you know, again, I learn a lot because I interview a lot of people around the world and I do these workshops all around the world. I've been doing them for 35 years. So I see the things that get in people's way and the commonalities. That's what guided how I did How Women Rise. So we all have good ideas about how we can build more inclusive workplaces and what we could do and how people could act differently and we could act differently and our teams could be led differently. But what stops us is we have these emotional responses to certain people, to certain situations, to certain comments, et cetera. And they, we respond to these in a way that makes it, us difficult, makes it difficult for us to do what we recognize we should do. Fairness is a perfect example because people will so often feel that this organization is unfair. I can't believe they promoted him instead of me. I had more, I made a bigger contribution. It's not fair. I hear it from, from women all the time. It's not fair. I hear it from men. Oh, you have to be a woman now to get promoted. I hear it from white people. Oh, you know, white people can't get a break here. I hear it from African Americans when I'm working in the U.S. We can't get a break. You, you hear it all the time. People feel it's unfair and that makes it very difficult. You have to deal with that emotional response. You have to, to some extent, rewrite the script 
so that you can respond in a more positive way before you can start acting in a way that enables you to build strong relationships with people you may perceive as being different than you. So to quote our co-founder Stephen Covey, says easy, does hard. I want you to put yeah. your leadership cap on for a moment and coach me. Like you, I've spent th my entire career, th three decades, in the leadership business. And I think there's a couple of true things, but I want you to coach me for a moment. Uh, leadership is tough. It's not as aspirational as a lot of authors think it is or position in their books. It can be unrelenting. It can be unrewarding. It's tough. Not every individual contributor should be a leader of people, but in most companies, it's the only way to get promoted and earn more money and have more influence. I think in many ways, people are lured into leadership because that's their career growth. Let's talk about the average leader of people, say me. Uh, leadership in companies is, I think, increasingly challenging post-pandemic because you have virtual teams, you have four generations or more in the workplace, and all of these nuances now of what you can and cannot say and what used to be appropriate is not appropriate, and almost you need a Google, a Google Sheet to keep track of the things you might say that could not just offend someone, but could get you fired, even with no intention to insult someone. And companies aren't democracies. Not everybody's voice counts. Not everybody's opinion can be considered. And for for-profit companies that have quarterly results, you're under massive pressure pressure to deliver the top line and the bottom line. You're supposed to hire and coach and terminate and exit people graciously. You're supposed to promote and be equitable. And it's difficult. It's really hard to make sure everybody feels included and has a voice, especially for people that work with you that lack self-awareness, that have no idea what their blind spots are. And their entire day is spent accusing you of all your conscious or subconscious biases, not all day long, but it's a tough role. What do you say to leaders out there that say, uncle, no thank you? <laughs> uncle, no thank you. Yes. First of all, if, if I'm coaching you, I would say you are overcomplicating it right now. And you are trying to manage everybody's perceptions rather than deciding what it is, what the one, two, or three things that are most important uh, to you as a leader to establish. You have deciding those three things, articulating them, articulating them over and over and holding people to account for them, that's where you want to start. And if people are thinking you're this or you're that, uh, you know, that's what's gonna happen. That's why I have that trigger in there about managing perceptions. Let me give you a great example from our, uh, MG, you know, our 100 coaches group. And that has to do with Alan Mulally. I tell a story about him in the book. But Alan is a fascinating case study. He went from uh, being a very senior executive at Boeing after spending his entire career in aerospace and got hired on as CEO of Ford Motor Company by Bill Ford when they were really, really struggling. Now, Ford was, did not have much of a history of promoting people from outside, much less hiring a CEO with zero experience in the car industry. So there was tremendous skepticism of Alan. Uh, he did two things. First of all, when he, in his first leadership team meetings, this is what with the generals and colonels, as they were known at Ford, very hierarchical legacy. At that first meeting, he said he got a question that was kind of a got you, you know, very complicated technical uh, question. And he said, look, I am not a car guy. I don't have experience in this industry. I've been an aerospace guy. And he showed him his little I guess today we call it an emoji. He has his face on the front of a plane. And that's how he signs all his letters. He showed him that. And he said, this is where I come from. This is where my expertise lies. He said, so this is not a question. Your question is not one I can answer. However, 
There are people in this room and people throughout this company who can answer that. And my job is to make sure that they are in communication and they have the freedom and the leverage to be able to make the right decisions for this company. That's, he said, you know, you've been led by people who had this expertise. You are $18 billion in debt. Give me a chance. So that was number one. The other thing, and this is really important in terms of, of, of leadership, he said, I'm going to make, there are going to be two rules for how we run meetings and how we conduct um, our relationships in this organization. He said, one is you never publicly criticize someone's idea. So if you're in a meeting, you don't say, well, the reason that would never work is et cetera, et cetera. You just let it stand out there and then you, you know, you're part of the solution. But you do not criticize people's ideas in person and you do not ever talk behind people's back. No gossip. We are changing the culture. So this is what he put in place as his two rules. Now, there were certain certainly people there who did not like that and who came up to him and said, look, you know, I don't buy this. I don't buy what you're trying to do. I don't buy these hall monitor rules. And he said, you don't have to buy it. I don't care what you think. I care how you act. Um, but you have to, so you have to abide by these two rules. And he had a couple of very senior, extremely skilled people, you know, high performers who said, you know, I don't want to do that. I feel like you're being too politically correct. And he said, fine, I'm sure that they will appreciate your skills at your next company. Uh, you know, clear out your desk, basically. The, this is non-negotiable. And I think that's really important for leaders to do. And of course, he had a lot of confidence. He'd been at it for a long time. But think of what are the one or two things that you really want to make sure that characterize the culture you are building. Be very clear about what those are. Constantly reiterate them. He reiterated them throughout meetings he had. He said, and then, you know, and then hold people to account, no matter what high performers, uh, how high performing they may be. So he was able to do that. There are a couple other things he did, but I think that was really in terms of what relates to triggers, really, really important. He recognized that people getting savaged in meetings for things they'd said, ideas they raised, uh, and also the, the sort of culture of gossip were creating toxicity and holding people back from being able to collaborate well. I'm still really from you telling me I was overcomplicating it, but I think you're right, which is why you're <laughs> such a great coach. Uh, uh, that was a riveting story. Uh, Dr. Covey would have loved Alan Mulally because Dr. Covey was, like Alan, intolerant of gossip. And we know that the cancer, the biggest cancer in every organization, is the fairly common human behavior of gossip. And when you can eliminate that as a non-negotiable the, the, the respect and the inclusivity it releases otherwise is inconquerable. Let's talk about some of the triggers. We don't have time to go through them all, so let's do a speed round. Speed round with Sally, about two to three minutes each. You talk about trigger number two, managing perceptions, and you write, we rise together by neither over nor under managing what others think. Okay, the doctor is in. Give us some coaching on what that means to find that right balance between either over or under managing the perceptions of others. Well, yes, certainly many women and many, many people who feel themselves to be outside the leadership mainstream get involved in over managing perceptions. If I say this, what will people think? Oh, it's kind of a, a no win situation. If I come on too strong, it might turn some people off, but if I don't speak up, then they're gonna think I have nothing to say, fine. It, it, and this is advice I've given many, many times. Your job is not to manage what other people think. If Dr. Covey were here, he would say it may be 
uh, your circle of concern, but it's not your circle of control. You want to align those two. You cannot control what other people think. So your job is to try to convey what you intend to do, what you need to do, how you're doing it, uh, how you plan to do it, and what you have contributed in as clear and a concise way as possible. That's a lot of work in itself. So don't get overly involved. That doesn't mean you don't take feedback, but you don't want to get overly involved in, oh, I don't know what they'll think, or that guy might, I know he doesn't like when people, okay, fine, you know, just let it go. The other thing is I've noticed that often people who are in the leadership mainstream undermanage perceptions. It's like, I don't care what anyone thinks. This is how we're doing it. And that gets into the sort of my way or the highway thing. And so they're, you know, unnecessarily brusque, et cetera. One thing about leaders like Dr. Cubby, who I had a chance to meet, uh, and uh, Alan, Alan Mullally is there, and Marshall in his home way, are they're, they're people who are always sort of buoyant and in a positive mood and who don't, aren't looking to attack other people. So, you know, they, they, they don't take that, you know, I don't manage any perceptions. I don't care what anyone thinks. So we want to find a way to come down in the middle there. Sally, what do you say to someone that hears you right now and intuitively they say, this is great counsel, this is wisdom based on principles, and they acknowledge your, 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 your insight and they work in a highly politicized culture. And the only way to rise, to build their career is to carefully, almost Machiavellianly, negotiate this culture that is bigger than them. And politically, they have to play the game that requires you obsessing with or thinking about, well, this person will like that, and so I'll talk to that person first, and then I'll go to that person. And it can be consuming, and it, it creates jealousies and paranoia. And, and that's true. It's real. I'm not overcomplicating that. Maybe no. I am. How would you coach someone that's trying to thrive in a company that has a vicious political culture, and they want to stay but this is reality for them. Well, a vicious political culture is different than a political yes, culture. Yes. Every organization I've been around has a political right, culture. Right. And you, so you want to be very careful about your sequencing, who you talk to first, who, you know, who, what's appropriate to say to this person, what's not. I personally don't, I'm a big fan of Machiavelli, especially in the Tim Parks translation into English. And I think there's a lot we can learn from really thinking strategically and how could this backfire and et cetera, et cetera. But that's different in my view than trying to be overly invested in what everybody thinks. Here's one reason, yeah. Scott, is people change their mind as they get to know us. So I, you know, we've had that experience. Somebody thinks, well, oh, why did you say that? That was a dumb thing to say. You should have kept your mouth shut. Okay. Um, you know, we don't respond. We just, like, okay, that's information. Uh, we don't necessarily change if we thought that we handled the situation well. And then a month later, we find out that they think we're fabulous because of what we did that they had been critical of. So that's part of, you know, the problem with overmanaging perceptions there as well. So I think it's just, it, politics are, are part of, of human organization. It's never something that's going to go away. And it can be very challenging and it can also be quite interesting uh, to learn to get better at that if we accept eh, politics, that's how it is. A vicious political culture, I would argue, is something that we probably want to think carefully about because it, you know, it's, it's rare that unless we have, you know, a certain kind of personality or certain in certain profile that it's going to really benefit us. So I think that we, we don't want to characterize political culture in general as vicious because it is so widespread and so unlikely that any of us will ever work any place where it's not political. 
Beautifully said. Sally, do you find that in your coaching of leaders at all levels that there's an increase in people's willingness to quit? Quit bad bosses, quit vicious cultures. Do you find that people are kind of now exhibiting more confidence and almost like unilateral decision, I'm leaving. Whether I have a job or not, I'm out. Definitely. I see that, and I see it especially with younger people, but it's partly, you know, that it's, you're no longer seen as this complete loser if you've had seven or eight jobs by the time you're 50 years old. That used to be the case. Oh, I think this resume, we couldn't possibly consider yeah. this guy because he's had so many different jobs. There must be something wrong with him. That mentality is gone. It also could mean, wow, there is a go-getter. You know, he or she keeps moving to different opportunities. So I think that's played an important part in it. I think the desire to be able to enjoy your life has played a big part of in it and that COVID has certainly played a role in that. People have returned home. They've seen the importance of neighborhood, of family. Uh, they've gotten comfortable with that and they don't want something that makes it impossible. But thirdly, and I think this is really under acknowledged, work is so much more intense and demanding than it used to be. You know, any of us who had a father, most of us didn't have a, you know, many of us did not have a mother who also worked um, unless she was a school teacher or a nurse. But the hours that people who worked worked were so much fewer. They Their weekends never got never. coached. Right. They didn't get back at, you know, at nine o'clock because there was some big deadline. They, you know, it was just a very different world. You could have a life. You could be a parent uh, and and a neighbor and and have friends and also have a really good job. And people know that work is much more demanding and technology has played a role in that. So number one, people are not eager to, uh, to sacrifice their whole life for work because they, if, unless they feel that, they, I mean, not, they're not willing to do that, but but they're not also willing to make major sacrifices if the work is consistently unsatisfying over time. So that makes them more willing to say, you know what, this is not worth it. And I think women to some degree pioneered this. I heard women saying, you know, it's not worth it. This is not worth it. The money and the prestige are not worth what this is doing to me, to my life, to my family, my world, and my health. So I think you know that trend has exacerbated and spread to men and to women, and part of it is just the change in the nature of work. Okay, two more triggers, and we'll let you go. I'm mindful of our time. Speed round, trigger number three. You call it confidence and competence. We rise together by distinguishing overconfidence from competence. Interesting chapter. Riff on that. It is an interesting chapter, and, and some of the ideas were adapted from our colleague Tomas uh, Chamorro Premuzic, who wrote a fantastic book called Why Are Only a Man Could Write This? Why Are There So Many Terrible Male Bosses? And basically, what he was looking at, and he does amazing research, was the prevalence of overconfidence among male senior executives. That is confidence that is untethered to actual competence. For the last perhaps 15, 20 years, women have all often been urged, you know, be confident, become confident, you know, do mantras that tell you what a fabulous person you are, et cetera, et cetera. But confidence untethered to actual competence or achievement is not very rewarding and is probably only, um, only possible for people who are not exactly tethered to reality. Uh, so, so becoming, we tend to conflate confidence with overcompetence. 
and see, I mean, overconfidence and see competence as mere, oh, he's merely competent. Competence is important, as is professionalism, as are a lot of other sort of, you know, virtues uh, that have, have gotten short shrift lately. So what I want to see more of is people tying their confidence firmly to their own competence and being able then to articulate or build the case for why they should be rewarded, compensated, um, promoted, et cetera, based upon their demonstrated competence, uh, rather than feeling that they have to just, you know, assume, put on the armor of being a highly confident person in all situations. I'm haunted by the concept of being tethered or untethered to reality. I think it increasingly describes my leadership style. Where were you 20 years ago in my life? Okay, last one. You were around, I just hadn't discovered you yet. Uh, trigger number eight you call, that's not funny. We rise together by getting humor right. Send us off on what that means because I think it describes a lot of my career, right? My intent was rarely aligned with my technique. I found myself often saying, well, that's not what I meant and I didn't mean to offend you. And I thought that was funny until I realized human resources called me down to say, how many of you I offended in this meeting and my, my very employment is on the line. And this is not a joke. It's kind of funny in hindsight, but not funny overall. Um, educate us here. Yeah, you know, I think this is really, really uh, important because I have heard too many people, and in particular men, say, you know, I used to really enjoy telling jokes or, you know, trying out humor, uh, but now I'm so worried, this is over-managing perceptions here uh, from the male side, but now I'm so worried about offending people or I've had pushback or people have come up to me and said, you know, that joke was completely inappropriate, that I've just decided I'm going to abandon trying to use humor altogether. This would be a terrible loss in the workplace. Humor is so important. It's a release. It's a way of bonding with other people. It's a way of establishing uh, firm relationships. It's a way of enjoying the actual process of work rather than you know feeling like we have to separate, well, there's real me and then there's work me. So we cannot afford to lose humor. It is far too valuable. At the same time, we need to recognize that in today's workplace, because it is so diverse, not just in terms of demographics, but also in terms of values, that the kind of humor, especially jokes, that were acceptable 20 years ago. I started my career in advertising in the late 60s in New York. This was the exact uh, madman era. And so much that was, would be inappropriate now was just routine. And a lot of jokes were, were, were routine. And those no longer work. So two things. One thing that I think is really important is that we start decoupling jokes and taglines and really you know, snappy quips from the idea of humor. And understand that humor can be really intrinsic in a situation and that those who are able to ride with it, and I got some wonderful examples in the book of, of you know, one uh, leader who had started a meeting by uh, asking a woman he had fired that uh, the day before who was no longer present, you know, let's hear from Mary. And people were like, whoa, <laughs> that, that didn't land well. But he realized it. He realized it in the moment. And he stood up and, and said, you know what? I'm going to start this meeting over. That didn't work. That wasn't appropriate. And he walked out the door and he came back in. And he said, let's talk about the elephant in the room first, that Mary is no longer here. So he was able to recoup, and he really led, I would say, in that moment with some grace, 
with some humility, with some willingness to uh, recalibrate very quickly and see that what he'd done was inappropriate rather than, this is what we often do when we feel that we made a mistake. You know, those people lack a sense of humor. If you ever hear yourself telling someone or complaining to someone else that a person lacks a sense of humor, uh, you know you're going down the wrong path. Instead, what he did in that case was he was able to adjust and he did it in a, a humorous way with a light touch. We need this so much in the workplace now. And I think, you know, one of the big themes of this book is that we really need a rising together is that we really need to start giving one another the benefit of our goodwill rather than hunting down what might be microaggressions or things we think are uh, inappropriate and then holding somebody, holding that over them for some continuing period of time. We need more grace, we need more humility, we need more giving others the benefit of goodwill, not the benefit of our doubt, but the benefit of our goodwill. And we can do that through humor, we can do that through how we build connections, we can do that through how we build our network. Uh, certainly we can do that through how we position ourselves, uh, how we lead. Amen to that. Send us off unpacking a, f a word you used a few minutes ago where you talked about professionalism. It's not a word that I hear very often. I'd like you to take a minute in, in 2023, recognizing that companies have different cultures and different geographies and their circumstances and situations. What does it mean for you when you think about a culture of inclusion, what does professionalism look like, sound like, feel like? I think in terms of a, a culture of inclusion, professionalism means the ability to show up, to do your work, to put in your best effort, and to try to find out if that is working for other people. You know, here's how I did this. I did this task this way. It's how I'm most accustomed to doing it. Uh, I've developed some facility in doing that. Um, how did that work for you? How did that work for the team? How did that work for you as my collaborator or somebody I'd like to be collaborating with more on this project? It's a very professional approach. I do believe that we have gotten sort of overly focused on what is authentic to me, on showing up as my completely authentic self, sometimes at the cost of professionalism. And I see people who behave in ways that are uh, painful for other people say, well, that's just me. I've got to be me. Uh, that's not a professional way to be in the world. So it's that recognizing that there are other sensibilities, there are other boundaries, and then testing those, seeing where we may need to make an adjustment. That's where I think, uh, that's how we demonstrate real professionalism in uh, an inclusive culture and a highly diverse environment. Sally, I don't wanna crash your website, but if someone wanted to hire you as a coach, how would that happen? Uh, I'm mostly doing speaking right now, but certainly welcome all inquiries. Uh, my website uh, is sallyhelgeson.com, and I have a contact button on there, and I get messages all day long from people who hit that contact button, and I always answer them. So that's the best, really the best way of doing it. I'm on LinkedIn, I'm on Twitter, but uh, the direct message systems there get a little bit overloaded. Stand by for a few more coming your way. The book is <laughs> Rising Together, How We Can Bridge Divides and Create a More Inclusive Workplace, Rising Together by Sally Hegelson. What's next for you? What is next for me? I'm sticking with getting this book out there. Uh, for the next year, doing every single thing I can. I think it's really an important book. This is a hot topic in organizations. It's only going to become more so. Uh, diversity uh, uh, in the workplace is not going away. So this is where I am focused right now, is developing workshops around this, 
Uh, I'm doing uh, doing two this month in uh, Kuala Lumpur and Singapore. So I want to really spread the word out here. Your class act. Sally, thank you for rejoining us. And although it won't be in the next year because you're a disciplined and focused author and consultant, we hope that if there is uh, another version of this coming in a few years, we'd love to have you back. You have a standing invitation to return to On Leadership. Thanks for your time today. Thank you, Scott. It's always a pleasure to, to be with you and do anything with the, with the Covey organization. We appreciate that. And we'll see you back here next week for a new conversation on leadership.